271, standing on the promises. we learn and memorize things, don't we? And some of us know these songs by heart because we've been singing them all our lives and generations of Christians have been singing these wonderful truths. Same is true of the Apostles' Creed. Sometimes repetition can be dangerous because we don't think about what we're saying. That can happen with the hymns, it can happen with the Apostles' Creed. So if we're going to do these things, it's my responsibility to make sure that we're thinking about what we're saying. If you believe these things, we invite you to say the Apostles' Creed with us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the one universal church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, it's good to hear the words of the hymns, of the words of the Apostles' Creed, and these things that uh, we know are true. We know they're not uh, inspired of God like the Bible, but those who believe the Bible have written down words of hymns. Uh, they've written down uh, the Apostles' Creed, and the Apostles' Creed is something that the church across the board through generations has said, these things are true. The Bible does teach these things, and and we agree. The very first thing I believe in God the Father Almighty, we believe that he is the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, we have not made ourselves. Creation hasn't created itself. There is a creator. And we thank you, Father, for that awesome revelation, that uh, thing that makes so, such perfect sense, just like all of your word to us. When we look around and we compare it with real life, it it is confirmed over and over and over again. When we listen to you about how to run our families and how to run society and how to do church and how to do all of these things as we glean from your word and the closer we get to your will on all of those things, the better things are because they work the way the designer intended. And we know we're in a world of sin where innocent people suffer because your will hasn't been followed in this world. And we know through it all you're doing something amazing. Uh, you're revealing yourself and you're exposing sin for what it really is. And we're involved in that right now. And, and it involves pain for you. We know you're suffering with sin in your creation. And you've asked us to suffer with you. With you in the sense that we're there for you and we're listening and we're willing to be your faithful servants no matter what it means to us on this earth. So we come to you asking, not my will be done, but thy will be done. In this service, we want your will to be done. We ask for it. We ask your blessings upon each listening ear, each heart here today, that you would speak to all of us and that our ears would be open to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. We are really glad all of you are here for whatever connection you have. Uh, the main connection is the one we have with God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? And as I've said from the Apostles' Creed, we acknowledge the universal church. Uh, we've in the past used the word Catholic. That's another word for universal. That means all over the world. If uh, the people have received the true Christ of Holy Scripture, they are our family. I don't care what language they speak. I don't care what culture they're in. All over the world, if they've received the true Christ of Holy Scripture, they are part of our family. And I love meeting family members, don't you? Amen. And we're glad you're here as part of the family of God. And if you don't, if you don't know what it means to be a part of the family of God, we'd love to guide you from God's Word through that process where you can be a part of God's family. It makes all the difference. It makes all the difference in this world. But more importantly, it makes all the difference for eternity. And so if you have any questions about that, we invite you to talk to us, those of us who know him, if you don't. Do we have any special announcements? I know we have a youth retreat coming up on Labor Day weekend. I don't know if we have any details on that. I have one detail. I'm going to be the evangelist at the Labor Day retreat, so you have that to look forward to. Okay, the children's choir will not meet next Sunday. Pam. November 6th. Sometimes we have these dates and somehow our calendars get messed up and we don't make them. So I got to make sure I make this one. 
I was not able to be at movie night. I'm really sorry about that. That, that was a misunderstanding uh, of our calendars. My fault. But uh, I've heard y'all had a great time. Y'all don't need me to have fun, do you? <laughs> so glad y'all y'all did that. I was at a, I call it a mini revival in Port Natchez, Texas, and God was with us in a real way, special way. As I preached on Friday night, and then I taught in a seminar-type setting on Saturday, and God, God worked, and thank you for your prayers for that. Any other announcements? No Board of Stewards meeting on the 26th. Does that mean we're just skipping one? Great. Thank you. Because <laughs> I think I'll be gone during the board meeting. <laughs> uh, that works out really well. Anyone else? We had the joy of uh, baptizing a young lady today after, at the end of the service. And so I say that in case I get wound up in what I'm doing, you'll say, point to that and remind me of that. I don't want to forget that. That's uh, something I'm excited about. I know they are too. Visitors here for that occasion, so I definitely don't want to forget about that. Thank y'all for being here. Any other announcements? Do you have any prayer needs? If you do, we don't want you to speak them right now, but uh, we ask that you stand, and we're going to take down names, and we're going to pray for you during the week. So if you, if you have a need, uh, please just stand right now. We're going to pray for you. doesn't require you to do anything but stand. Some burden on your heart, something that you want us to bring to the Lord on your behalf. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these who are standing. Their confidence not in uh, what they ask and the prayers that, that we speak. We, we don't know always. The Bible says we don't know often what to ask for. But your Holy Spirit does. And so we don't have confidence in our prayers. We have confidence in the God we're praying to. And we ask that you would help in every situation that's represented by each person standing here. Lord, you know them. Uh, you love them. You understand what they're facing or what their loved ones are facing. And we ask that you would undertake, bring comfort and peace to them and provision to, to the need that they're standing for. Uh, we ask that you would... Uh, minister your Holy Spirit to those who don't know you. And Father, we're so passionate about it. We might be steamrollers sometimes, and we don't want to get in your way or run ahead of you. But we love you so much, and we want everyone to know Jesus and help us to proclaim that gospel. And those who may be praying for somebody that they love that needs to know our Lord, we pray especially for them. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The rest of you can stand. We're going to sing Amazing Grace, number 202. 202. Thank you. 
talk about something that never gets old, right? Especially when God the Holy Spirit uses it for his sake. Thank you for that great singing. We need our ushers at this time. We're going to receive the offering if, as you remain standing until we pray. Brother Jerry Fielder, would you pray over this offering for us? Appreciate it. Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy coming, you may be seated.
Amen. Make you want to clap even when the preacher doesn't like it, right? <laughs> Won't take the time to explain that today. But. We don't go by what the preacher likes, do we? <laughs> Amen. That's true. Amen. Did y'all do your homework? Did you read 1 Corinthians 9, verses 4 through 14? Did you do your homework? If you weren't here last Sunday, you're excused from your homework, but everybody else. You remember I said, y'all can read that at home. We weren't, we're not going to read it today, but God said we're going to read it today. So I want to do what God says, not what the preacher says. 1 Corinthians 9, beginning with verse 4, the Apostle Paul is the instrument. He's writing to the church at Corinth, which is one of those churches he helped establish by his preaching of the gospel. Verse 4, have we not power or the right or the authority to eat and drink? Have we not the authority or the right to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have we not that right to forbear working? And he means by that secular employment. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Our military men, they are going on the behalf of the nation and we pay for their Equipment, we pay for their clothing and we pay for their housing and we pay for their food. That's the illustration he's using. Who planteth a vineyard and is not allowed to eat of the fruit of that vineyard? Who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man? Is this just what I think? Or does God say it? saith not the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. That he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it... A great thing if we shall reap of you your physical things or your carnal things. Or let's get right down to it, your money, right? Because that's how we get our carnal things. If others be partakers of this right over you, are, are not we rather also? Nevertheless, we've not used this right. But we allow all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Again, in reference to the Old Testament. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live, make their living of the gospel. Now you know why it's hard for a local pastor to preach on giving. Because he's talking about himself, isn't he? Just like the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was in a great position because, because of his role as a missionary and church planter, he did not want anyone to think he was doing it for himself and for the money. And so in starting churches, he didn't ask for anybody to give him anything. He, he didn't want that. Of course, he didn't have a family either, did he, John David? <laughs> he was all by, he was a single guy, and God wanted him that way because of what he called him to do. But he's saying, we have the right, even though I haven't used that right. Last Sunday, we had the important part of this message. Jesus dealt with one of those people, and there were several that asked this question, what must I do to go to heaven? What must I do to have eternal life? How much must I do to make it to heaven, in other words? How much must I give to God to make it to heaven? Do y'all remember the answer? 
It was asked another way, what must I do, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> Sell everything. That's right, you're getting to the answer, aren't you? How much does it take? How much do I have to give? Well, there was one man that asked that question, and he was an expert in the Old Testament, if you'll remember. And Jesus, how do you read it? He said, how do you read it? And the answer was, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you answered right. When someone says, how much does it take? The answer is, all. It takes it all. The question on how much, the answer came, everything. Everything. You must, by faith in what Jesus accomplished, accept him as Lord. You don't own your life anymore. He does. It's not he's asking you to give 10%. He's asking you to give 100%. He's asking you to surrender ownership. I don't own my life anymore. And remember, I said, you don't have to have it all together. He does. All you do is just wrap it up in the rags of your life and bring it to him. Song that says that. Wrap it up in the rags of your life. Bring it to him. Accept him as Lord. You don't know what Lord means? I have one of those good apps that I can quickly look some of this stuff up. And my Blue Letter Bible is a good app if you want a nice study aid. And I looked it up and they said in biblical usage under the Blue Letter Bible, it says, Lord, he to whom a person belongs, about which he has put power of deciding. I belong to him, he has power to decide. The one in charge. It's a title of respect and reverence. And, of course, it was used at times for those in authority over them under God. They said Lord to other people. But there's only one Lord of Lords and King of Kings, isn't there? And today we're talking about what it takes to be with him forever. He has to be Lord. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? So we're talk, we talk about the name, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you got a little sample of that when we had our VBS program and Andrew had his children's sermon that day. You got a little sample of that. What does it mean to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Lord means he's in control. He's in charge. Jesus is his given name because he would save his people from their sins. Christ is his office because he came as the anointed of God, the Messiah, to pay the price for my sins and yours, qualified to die and then died on the cross for me. Lord means he decides. What must I do? How much must I give? All is the answer. When Jesus is Lord, you want to know his will. You want to know his will. We may, be to we may be so ignorant, and we are when we come to him. We have so much to learn, but we want his will in our lives. And so we ask these questions. What would God have me give? And Jesus taught us last Sunday about reaping and sowing, but remember, it wasn't sowing to the flesh as too many people teach on that subject. And too many churches use that to get people to give. Well, if you'll give to the church you'll get tenfold back or a hundredfold in return in your own bank account, and that's not what God's Word says. Now, there are some benefits by doing it the way the designer designed things to go. Don't misunderstand me. There are some things that can happen for good because you're listening to God. But sowing and reaping is not about the flesh. It's not about getting me a brand new house or a new car or things going my way in this world. It's about things going his way. In Galatians 6, 8, it says, He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You die to the, you 
give and sacrifice for the flesh, well, you're going to get corruption. But you give to God as God, and you reap everlasting life. By giving for the sake of the kingdom and reaping for the sake of the kingdom, then we get to be a part of that kingdom. As in our topic, giving directly for the ministry of the word, one of the most difficult things for a pastor to preach on is giving to the church because it appears that he may be trying to make his support package go up, and that's not what it's all about. That's why you hardly ever have me preaching on giving because of how it feels. But the Lord has challenged me and told me I had to preach the whole counsel of God whether I like it or not. Our topic, giving directly for the ministry of the word to help you in feeding your family the word of God. To help you in feeding you so that you can feed others out there. It's a supplemental ministry for you. It's vital. It's, it's so important for us. I need it in my life. That's the subject that God has Paul address here in 1 Corinthians 9 and the established principle of the support of those called into pastoral ministry. That resource of a man called of God to be undistracted by the obligations of work, it says here in our context, of secular employment. That doesn't mean he doesn't have a work to do. But it's different than the secular employment and too many times a pastor has been looked at as just a secular employee of the church, and that's not what God intended. God intended that God's people who work secularly out there in the workforce, they give so that He doesn't have to do that. That He can tend to the Word of God. That He can pour Himself into the Word of God and pray and seek the face of God that He might feed God's people. Yeah, he has to minister the word. So that means you got to put some miles on the car and you got to go to Port Natchez and you got to go to your house and you got to go to the hospital and you got some other places to go. But I'm not the only one doing that. I'm feeding you so we can all do that together. But this important supplemental role, seeking God other than going to work every day. And sadly, there are a lot of bivocational pastors and you really need to Pray for the bivocational pastors. They're trying to hold down a secular job and they're trying to do what God called them to do and be faithful in feeding the people of God. It's the greatest challenge I could ever imagine. And even when I couldn't afford to be a full-time call preacher, I had a wife who liked to support the pastor. And I was so blessed that I was able to do that. Not obligations of secular employment, not office hours, where is he? We pay him to be here. Not uh, bosses, not performance reviews, not administrative duties. The right to not have to do that. That's what Paul said, the right to forbear working. What if you're, you free your pastor up for office hours? What if you free your pastor up for administrative duties in the church? What if you free him up and he just becomes an employee? We have missed the whole reason we give. And I understand at the last board meeting, which I wasn't able to attend, we talked about pastor burnout. And if I understood the stats right, it was something like 80%. Is, it, is that close? Something like that? Why is that? It's because we're asking them to do the job that God has called them to do, and we're asking them to do everything else as well. It doesn't work. And we can build mega churches with these type A personalities who are doing it all, but they're burning both ends of the candle, and they're destroying their families and their own lives too often. We need everyone involved. In order to be fed the word, in order to feed the Lord's sheep. You remember that exchange between the Lord and Peter? Peter had failed the Lord three times, as you know, and God's grace came to him and said, you can be forgiven. But he asked him three times something. Do you love me? And he's going to be a minister in the church of Jesus Christ. Do you remember what he asked him? Do you love me? 
There's a lot of play in the words there. I don't want to get into all that because Peter said, oh, yeah, I, I feel love towards you so much. And the Lord said, but are you committed to me? Agape love. But I, I said, I wasn't going to talk about that. I couldn't help it. <laughs> but what did he say when he said, do you love me? And Peter said, yeah, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. You love me? You know I love you, Lord. Why are you asking me again was his attitude. Feed my sheep. You love me? Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Lambs, lambs, and then sheep. Jeremiah 3.15. I will give you pastors according to my heart. This is God speaking. I'll give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's God saying, that's the pastor I want for you. How can you minister uh, without this most important resource? You would be handicapped. You would be limited if you don't have the resource that God designed for you in the called ministry. You're handicapped without it. And the Church of Jesus Christ has made pastoral leadership about church building instead of theological research and about the word of God. You've heard me talk about it before. There are sermon services. They say, you're too busy to do sermon research and work, so let us do that for you while you do all the important stuff. And we actually get mail like that or emails like that. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 says, God has given those special equipping roles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, pastor teachers. And I... I believed since 1982 that God called me to be a pastor teacher. At times he calls me to be an evangelist. Other times he calls me to be those other things. But I know in my heart that God called me to be a pastor teacher. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to do that. Thanks to you. And it goes on to say he's given you these uh, special called Minister roles, why? For the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That you can do what you're, you need to be out there doing. You need to be ministering to your families. You need to be ministering to your neighbor. You need to be ministering at work. You need to be ministering as God's people and the church, wherever you are. And I'll give you these specialists that can be called of God to help you in that process. Because they're not going and punching their time clock, they're going to seek the face of God when you have to go punch a time clock. They wake up and say, I don't have to punch a time clock. I get to go and pray and seek the face of God and, and seek the burden of God for God's people that he would have me preach. And I can't get that out of a manual. I can't get that out of what somebody else has been preaching. I have to get it before God on my face in prayer and seeking his word. And when God gives me a seed for a sermon on Sunday, I say, thank you, Lord, because I can't do it without him. I need him. And your greatest work of sowing spiritual things comes to you at home. Most of your time and energy, energy and ministry and giving to the Lord is at home. In your marriage and giving to your family I don't have time to preach the rings of responsibility but that I preach, but that's where your ministry is primarily. You have this supplement God has given you, ministering to your family. And if you're faithful in ministering to your family, then God may allow you to minister in the church. And it's not just the call preachers who do that. If that were the case, then we could go really nowhere. And then, as you have opportunity, minister to other people. For the sake of the, this vital ministry to you, there must be a resource called the called minister, one by principle set free from the secular employment to make the study of the word of God his job and the feeding of the flock his job so that you can do what God needs you to do. Y'all see how beautiful that is by God's design? Pastors still have a family, don't they? 
Everything I just told you about yourself is true of me, except where you're having to support your family with secular employment. I'm supporting my family by seeking after God and being a feeder of God's people. You have to seek after God too. This is priority and time that I'm talking about. The pastor still has a need for food, shelter, education for his children, recreation, rest. Sometimes you hear me talking about golf. I tell you, I need it. I don't know about everybody else. I don't know about Carl or Dick or anybody else, but I need it. Recreation, you know, to recreate, to be restored, to get your mind off of all of the daily grind like you're supposed to do it on the Sabbath day. The Lord said, remember, the priests work on the Sabbath day. We all need time of rest, don't we? We need planning for retirement, believe it or not, because the Lord, my rapture plan may not work out in retirement. (laughs) Bill was probably planning on that, right? But my dad was planning on the rapture plan. It didn't work out for him that way. He still, the pastor still has to live in the community, the culture, the place where you live. Just like you do. Somebody, oftentimes in a position of leadership over other churches, people say, well, how much should a pastor get paid? I don't think there's an answer to that anywhere in Scripture, but you know what I say? It's just generally kind of get the average of your congregation, and that should be your goal, that they get paid average of God's people. That's just the theory I have. Makes sense, doesn't he? He lives in your neighborhood. He has to send his kids where your kids go. He has to do the same things you're doing in your society and your culture and if he's going to minister. He has the word and opportunities like today, like in Port Natchez, like at camps and retreats and Bible studies. He needs the resources for those jobs. The Apostle Paul said, don't we have the right? Don't we have the, the, uh, the right to lead about a family, a sister, a wife, all of those things? And then he says all of these things about the law. Didn't it say that in the Old Testament? Isn't this what's being taught in the Old Testament? I thought we were free from the law. And we are, but not from the truths of the Old Testament not from the moral principles. The way the Holy Spirit spoke to them was different uh, with the Old Testament nation and the ordinances that they had and all of those things we could talk about, but the Holy Spirit was still teaching the truth. And every right principle is still real and right today that the Holy Spirit was teaching in the Old Testament. What He spoke hasn't changed. The right principles remain, and the Holy Spirit will guide us into all right conclusions. The law as that impossible standard relying on the flesh, of course, is gone. If you've received Christ, it never worked in the first place. It was there only to bring you to Christ. We sang about it, didn't we? Amazing grace. His grace taught my heart to fear. That's what the law does. It teaches you you need a Savior. And my fears, that same grace relieved. The ordinances that pointed to Christ, those are gone. Remember all the ordinances of the Old Testament, all of that law stuff that was ordinances pointing to a Messiah is gone because he has come. The running of the nation, those principles now can be gleaned for all nations. But for the body of Christ, he comes personally to indwell and to teach. What he was teaching them then, that's what he's teaching us now. Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Listen, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. All the righteousness of the law, uh, he came He condemns sin in the flesh. Why? So that the right things, the right principles of the law might be fulfilled in us as we walk after the Spirit. 
Everybody gets the idea, oh, we're free from all that Old Testament stuff. No, you're not. Not from the truths of the Old Testament. The way God was teaching them is different, yes. And all of those things we could talk about and the ordinances that have already been fulfilled. But the principles are the same. We're still supposed to love God with all our heart and strength. Amen. All the right principles are still there. That's why 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth or chooses or decides from within. That's what the word purposeth means. In his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see the value of it. You understand it, the importance of it. And we give. It all belongs to God, and all we need are right principles applied to our heart and our circumstances. The principles are the same. Did y'all know in the Old Testament there were three tithes? There was one that was every three years, and that one was a 10%, but if you divide it out, roughly 3%. I'm not going to do any great math before you today. But there was a 10% for the running of the nation. There's a 10% for the ministry that we're talking about today, and there was another one that was every three years. Therefore, they paid 23%. Roughly. But one of those tithes was for the nation. Don't you wish we could go back to 10% taxation? But that's what it was for. The IRS takes way too much, don't they? That's a story for another time. Amen. That's probably the best amen I got in today. The IRS takes too much. The government takes too much. There were tithes for the ministry, though, the the pastors, the priests. You know, they were serving not just in the temple. They were serving in every community. Then they'd take their turn in the temple. Boy, they get to go home and say what they were doing in the temple and teach the principles that the Holy Spirit was teaching them through all of that. And then they had free will offering for all the other beyond those things. The church still asks that 10% be given for the ministry of the word. But even in the Old Testament where it was codified into the law of the land, the spirit of the law ruled not the letter, didn't it? And in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus and his disciples were going through the corn patch and it happened to be the Sabbath day and they were hungry and they grabbed some of the corn and you remember the religious leader said they're working on the Sabbath day what did Jesus say to them haven't you read about David when he was in an emergency situation he went to the temple and he got the showbread which wasn't lawful for them to eat because he was in an emergency situation and they needed it. And they're not slave to the letter of the law. They serve the risen Lord who teaches us the spirit of the law. And I'm confident as a pastor that God, the Holy Spirit, will take the principle of the tithe and apply it in your life. And I don't want a reporting. I don't want Dennis to be sending out bills because you're behind on your tithe. And I've heard horrible stories like that. God will teach you what you ought to give. Somebody who's never heard of the principle of the tithe and they're a young couple and their bills are stacked up to the ceiling and you tell them you got to give 10% to God. That's not my business to do that, is it? It's my business to teach the principle and let God apply it in their own hearts, in their own lives. God said if an ox is in the ditch, certainly get it out on the Sabbath day. As old preachers like to say, but don't drive it into the ditch on Saturday. But you got to get it out on Sunday. Too many people are doing that, aren't they? God applies the spirit and not the letter. But the principle is alive and well today. And I'm almost through because we get get to baptize somebody. But just think about this, the law. It's like our 20-mile-an-hour zone in school zones. That's been codified. That just means we put it into ordinance and law. But what's the moral principle? Valerie and Andrew's neighborhood, they've got people that have got signs in their yard. I love them. It says, drive like your kids live here. Drive like your kids live here. Now, that's getting to the moral. And I don't care if there's not a school zone sign around. If I see kids playing next to the road 
I'm going to be cautious because that's the moral principle. It doesn't have to be written in law for me to do it. If I'm going 75 miles an hour down the highway where it says you can, but some kids have gotten out on the shoulder of the highway, I'm going to come to a screeching halt, not because of the speed limit sign, because it's the right thing to do. That's the difference between the law, the letter, and the spirit, isn't it? If I've got a family member bleeding to death and I'm rushing to the hospital, I'll have a police officer help me and escort me to break the law. That's what God was saying. David wasn't breaking my law. He was breaking the the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. Be careful when children are present. That's the moral. It's the principle that God is teaching, whether it's written in local code or not. Let the Holy Spirit guide your heart. We don't write it into code, do we? You have to pay 10% to the church. You read about the principle. You understand the need. It's the same. And then you say, Lord, what would you have me do? Y'all know tithe means 10%. Y'all know that? We take tithes and offerings, right? We take people's 10% and we take offerings above and beyond that. I pray that God would lead you into the truth and you would do what he leads you to do and there'll be plenty for the work of the Lord. Let's sing, Paul and Jean. Number 373, where he leads me, I will follow wherever he leads me. 373. I won't. verse unless someone comes. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him, with him all. pray and then I want you to be seated. Father, thank you for this time that you've blessed us with. Thank you for your word, your truth, and how your Holy Spirit comes to be our teacher. Help us, Father. We all need to to grow and to learn, to be more what you call us to be, but thank you for your grace that in Christ we can forget about the law of sin and death because we're under the law of the Spirit. Thank you for the comfort that brings, the joy that brings. I don't have to live up to everything. I just got to listen to you, trust you as you apply what's right in my life. Help us, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to have someone come and witness of the reality of the cleansing of the blood of Christ in their heart. And now they want to tell everybody else about it in this beautiful, symbolic form. 
Bless it, Lord, for that purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.